Welcome to PAH.TV Clinical Insights. This discussion is about general considerations in the treatment of PAH and is moderated by Dr. Valerie McLaughlin. Our panel discussants are Dr. Nick Kim, Dr. Harold Polevsky, Dr. Paul Forfia, and Dr. Sean Studer. Hi, I'm Valerie McLaughlin from the University of Michigan, and I'm joined by four of my esteemed colleagues today to talk about some general considerations in pulmonary hypertension, exercise, diet, and some of the non-PAH specific pharmacologic therapies that we sometimes consider. Um, let's start with exercise, pulmonary rehabilitation. Nick, can you tell the audience a little bit about that? So when I started PH, I remember telling my patients, some of them, um, that think of yourself as a warm battery. You know, you take it easy, don't, don't strain yourself. But I think uh, with some recent data, kind of borrowing, I think, from advanced lung disease and heart failure uh, literature, we're seeing that formal exercise training can actually dramatically improve the quality of life, uh, exercise tolerance, et cetera, in our patients. So it seems like we've done a 180 degrees. Yeah, and Harold, maybe you can review a little bit of that data for us. We all know that when you exert yourself in any way, you increase your cardiac output, and if you have a restricted pulmonary vascular bed, your pulmonary pressures go up. And it was felt that that was detrimental long term. So we restricted patients' activities, at least at our center, we restricted them until we enlisted them for transplant, at which time we enrolled all the patients on the transplant waiting list in rehab. There was a study done in Germany that uh, shed some real light on this, and they took a group of patients with PAH and randomized them. And one group just got some counseling on activity, and another group was enrolled in a formal exercise program. They actually admitted them to the hospital for the first three weeks and had them exercise twice a day in the hospital with supervision. Then they discharged them, but called them every day to remind them to exercise. And they did that for uh, another three months. So the total duration of the study was about four months long. And during that period of time, the improvement in six minute walk was almost 100 meters, which is an, a number that we've not really achieved in our pharmacologic trials. And then they did something which I think really proved <clears throat> the benefits of this therapy. They took the control group and they offered them the same program. And about three quarters of the people in the control group went through it. Uh, they went through the same three week hospitalization and then outpatient period, and they achieved the same results as the initial group had, showing that the exercise was really uh, beneficial, improving functional status, and with that, improving their quality of life. Now this is not something that we would uh, think would be uh, sustained without other interventions on uh, our part uh, pharmacologically. And we also know from a long experience with exercise in COPD that it has to be continued. There has to be a maintenance program or else the benefits are lost over um, a few months, but this clearly shows that we can achieve significant improvements in our patients' functional status with supervised exercise programs. I think it was a really interesting trial, and I, I, you know, it's not always possible to admit someone to the hospital for them to exercise twice a day. Sean, what kind of practical tips do you give your patients about exercise when they may not be enrolling in a formal program? So I think some of them up front you have to consider safety. So the biggest thing is we want them to be active. But we're usually talking about things like light resistance or aerobic activity, light walking. We're not talking about heavy weights. And you certainly have to warn them, I think, that if they begin to become lightheaded, certainly have any chest pain or any other signs of new symptoms, the 
shortness of breath comes on more quickly when exercising, they should stop doing that level of exercise and ideally contact their providers and let them know that they're experiencing, that can be one of the things that warns us that things are getting worse. I think beyond that, we want to tell them things like don't do it on a day that's very hot or very cold. So they've got to be mindful of the environment in which they're exercising. For some, the safety piece is going to be doing it when someone's home or someone's around. So if it's not a formal supervised program, walking with someone to make sure that they stay safe. And I think, to Harold's point, when the patients were out of the hospital in that study, they were called to be reminded to exercise. I think some of our patients who we don't get in a formal program of some kind initially are probably going to need more encouragement from a family member, a support group, or someone else to stay with it because exercise in this way for pulmonary retention is not easy. A lot of our patients find it difficult and it's important to stay with it because of the potential gains they can make, but we really have to sort of encourage and cheerlead for them so that they stay with it. It's like a lot of people, the treadmill becomes the laundry drying rack in the, in the house, not, not an exercise tool. Yeah, for people other than pH patients yes. though as well. <coughs> so Paul, how do you use this data in your everyday practice? How do you prescribe pulmonary rehab or cardiac rehab or counsel them on exercise at home? What, what goes into your decision making? Sure. I think the f first thing we do is we are assessing the, the, the severity of the illness of the patient at the time we're counseling them and exercise, as Sean alluded to. So uh, our, our first job, as we all know, is in that kind of phase one of treating a patient with PAH, is to get the medical condition under relative control. Once we have done that, that is when we engage our patients on the role of exercise rehabilitation um, and physical reconditioning. And so when we have that discussion, the first thing we do is we explain to them why we're recommending it. And for many providers and for many patients, physical reconditioning is a blind spot. They feel that their limitations are solely related to their cardiopulmonary disease of PAH, but they have missed the fact that their entire body has become physically deconditioned from being constrained from physical exercise through dyspnea for months or years. So we explained to them that there is hidden gains to be made by physical reconditioning. And I would say that the first thing that we do in that context is we enforce two basic principles. Uh, one is simplicity and the second is consistency. So we want the patients to uh, go through some type of an exercise program that is simple uh, and classic examples of that include just walking at a modest pace at a sustained for a sustained period of time and that may only be five minutes but it then can build up and we encourage them that once they can easily do that five minutes of walking away from their house um, or, or on the treadmill that they go to seven that they go to ten and our goal for our patients is 20 to 25 minutes of aerobic exercise in the form of modest walking, uh, uh, supine uh, 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 stationary bike, or even a seated tabletop ergometer, which we use fairly often in our more incapacitated patients. So we keep it simple and we encourage them to do it often, uh, for example, five days a week. And in doing that, uh, we often get weight loss in addition to physical reconditioning, and then we're really achieving something uh, above and beyond the pharmacologic therapies. So I think you're kind of extrapolating um, from the studies. The, there were other couple reports as well s reporting similar findings, but my, my concern is that there's not a um, spe specific type of exercise or duration that's been prescribed, right? So I think Correct. these studies are... Um, encouraging so that I, I tell them, you know, get up and walk and, and to exactly what you said. But uh, I don't think we know that this is disease modifying, certainly, or are there long-term consequences of exercise? So I was rather actually surprised it was a 1A recommendation. I think um, uh, these are exciting early data, but I think we, we need to learn a little more about the details. We do have some data from exercise physiology that tells us that uh, doing a sustained activity, even a light level of activity, for, as Paul pointed out, at least 20 minutes, at least three times a week, um, can improve cardiopulmonary endurance. Um, so that's a, a reasonable starting point for, uh, for the patients. And, and often, um, my, my recommendation, it's a modification of uh, 
uh, pH therapies, but it's not a hall walk, it's a mall walk. <laughs> um, because um, malls tend to be generally flat and they're uh, temperature and humidity controlled, so it obviates the problems that patients have both in the cold weather and in the hot, humid weather. Philadelphia summers are not to be enjoyed. Um, and so um, uh, if they're not enrolling in a uh, supervised type program, that sort of opportunity may allow them to to derive this kind of benefit. So but let's go back to that. We're all talking about how we counsel patients, but are you guys routinely or frequently re recommending patients go into a supervised program? Yes. Yes, I mean, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think in the history of lung transplant, as an example, if you don't keep patients who find it very difficult to exercise in something that starts, it, it's hard to maintain. Yeah. Okay. Not in a functional class four patient. Of though. course. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. So let's segue from exercise to diet. Really, another important issue that we need to counsel our patients on. How do you guys approach that? They're so yeah. salt avid. You know, most of our patients are on diuretics, and uh, it surprises me. Sometimes they just don't connect that, you know, if they cut back on salt, maybe they can drink a lot of water, you know, so you have to kind of counsel them on a regular basis. And the other thing I always try to do is, is talk to the family members while they're, you know, while I'm talking to them so that somebody is there and uh, there's some accountability, if you will. They so. often tell on the patient, yes. right? Yeah. 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 So sodium restriction, I think, is important. Weight management, you want to talk a little bit about that, Sean? So I think all of these pieces are, are very tough. And arguably, for, for some of us who don't practice, I don't always eat as healthy as I should. It's harder to wag your finger at a patient and talk to them about what and where they're watching. I think you know for, for the weight and the exercise piece, enrolling them in the structured program is helpful. And I think for the diet piece, we found that having some of the support groups be really cooking demonstrations, like you might see on morning TV, and demonstrating to people. I mean, almost anyone can observe and learn how to exercise, maybe without a formal program. It's very, very hard to change eating habits. I think it's one of the most difficult for our patients. And so I think they need demonstrations. And it's certainly involving the family members and setting goals and talking about it and making them reasonable, and ideally not having them just be due to fluid because we can of course take someone we hospitalize, diurese them, and they, they shouldn't get too much credit for that weight loss because it really wasn't what we're looking for in the diet and exercise piece. But I think doing that as an outpatient is very important and uh, as you suggested, getting as many people involved to support them is helpful. Besides our support group, we, uh, we rely on um, resources from both the PHA where there are educational materials and also um, steal liberally from materials available from the American Heart Association for patients with left heart disease. There's some wonderful diet right. materials that uh, we hand out. Low sodium cookbooks yes. and heart healthy cookbooks, so that's all great. What about other lifestyle considerations that we, we need to counsel a new patient on? I think the anxiety and depression piece is something that we don't always address as much as we need. and. We found that and sometimes when they can't follow the recommendations for what we've covered, the exercise, the diet changes, or sometimes being adherent with their medications, really digging and seeing whether anxiety and depression is limiting them from being functional is a key piece. Very and common, isn't it? So, and it's very important, absolutely. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And, uh, and I would just underscore that there, there is this almost inevitable link between anxiety and depression and whether patients will uh, adhere to positive lifestyle changes. For many of our patients, the diagnosis of PAH is so devastating that things like proper food choices uh, and exercise become the least of their worries. But in this era of effective therapies alone and in combination, our patients are doing better and better, and our patients actually can succumb to these uh, poor dietary changes to, uh, to physical inactivity such that those aspects of their overall condition become more of an impairment to them than their pH itself when they're optimally treated. So I always remind our patients to not take their eye off of those things, but we always look for those barriers like depression because this can be a reason why patients have frankly given up and they don't feel like taking care of themselves in other ways are even worthwhile. Yeah, really, really great points. 
Um, what about pregnancy counseling, Nick? Yeah, I think I think that's probably one of the most stressful things we do in taking care of PH is you get that young PH patient who gets pregnant. Um, obviously, from the get-go, we counsel them against pregnancy. Uh, many of the therapeutics requires monitoring in the REMS program, but you know, still time to time, we see these patients come pregnant, and I think we all have had experiences uh, with the challenges of that with a high peripartum mortality. So it's a sensitive topic, and some patients really push you. Um, I'm feeling so well, can I get pregnant? But um, it's very important for us to kind of stand our ground and, and remind them they shouldn't get pregnant. Yeah. Um, let's move on. We, we have a lot of exciting PAH-specific drugs, but there are some other drugs that we sometimes use. Um, warfarin anticoagulation is probably the one that we talk about now and again. And there's been some I mean, more recent data, a little bit of uh, confliction about what to do, and everything's uncontrolled and, and observational only. So there's limitations. How do you approach warfarin anticoagulation at this point? So. Uh, although the data is um, always in evolution and flux and there is none really with uh, any of the newer oral agents, um, uh, there's a rationale for anticoagulating patients, particularly with uh, severe disease, core, uh, in patients with core pulmonale, thromboembolic disease had been the third leading cause of death. Um, we can certainly eliminate that in patients with uh, right heart failure. And there's evidence from histology within the lungs that our patients have uh, a component of in situ thrombosis from uh, battered and beat up pulmonary arteries serving as a nidus for thrombosis. So unless there's a contraindication to anticoagulation, my inclination is to anticoagulate our patients, but to do it in a prophylactic sense. So my target INR is uh, toward the 2 to 2.2 range rather than the full anticoagulation that I might use for um, uh, DVT or something else. So you're, you're using that in all of your PAH patients or, or just the idiopaths? Predominantly the idiopathics, um, but the, the histology has been seen in others, although the, the risks of anticoagulation, for instance, the scleroderma patients have a high incidence of intestinal telangiectasia and bleeding risks when you anticoagulate them. Sure, and I, I was particularly intrigued by the Compara data, the European registry, when they looked at anticoagulation, and again, observational, uncontrolled, and found similar benefits in the idiopaths, but it was really the first study to have a large number of associated PAH, and it didn't show a benefit in them. I think I'm getting a little more conservative. And well, the, the reveal rose. registry uh, didn't show a benefit, right, mm -hmm. with idiopathic, so I think the debate still goes on. So how do you approach it? So I think we have, I've personally moved slightly away from anticoagulation and maybe isolating it to the idiopathics, for which I think we have probably the best data among all the PAH. So certainly for scleroderma, Isaminger's liver patients, uh, we wouldn't anticoagulate those patients. Great. Well, we have so much exciting t news to talk about with therapies for pulmonary arterial hypertension, but there are a lot of other important issues that often don't get as much discussion, but are really, really important. So I enjoyed this discussion about exercise, diet, pregnancy, and, and oral anticoagulation. So thanks to the panel for a really interesting conversation, and thank you for joining us.